about what are the physical and the climatic environmental conditions of this area that we are going to study, what are the land uses in this region, what are the driving forces for land degradation in this area, what are these management, and if there are other different management managements possible to avoid degradation. Because we want to restore the soil properties. All this training in school is about restoration. So, we try to restore soil organic matter, soil structure, and water availability of soils. This is your tree. And this is the Tagus River. Dejo, or the Lisbon, mm -hmm. or the Portuguese people, and Tago, very strong name for us. You can see from the colors <coughs> that you are coming from a relatively humid environment to another dry environment. We can see here the figures. In this area around Setubal, we have the, average, the annual average, the mean annual is temperature 17 degrees Celsius. In the mid point of your trip, we have 16 degrees, and in Madrid we have 15 degrees in average. It seems that it is not too, too, too much the difference. But we have 640 millimeters of annual rainfall here. 518 millimeters in the center and around 400 millimeters in Spain, in Madrid, I mean. This very small difference has important consequences in soil landscape and in the way us, the people, try to manage this soil. In order to classify these different climates, it is very interesting to use the aridity index. You know that it is the precipitation divided by potential evapotranspiration. All you know this uh, uh, classification. We have hyper-arid zones, arid zones, semi-arid zones, and subhumid zones, according to this relationship. Again, this is the map of the Iberian Peninsula. You have been traveling in this gradient from less to high aridity index. <coughs> what is the rainfall, the annual rainfall in these regions? In Setuba you have more or less 700 millimeters, and in Madrid you have, as you mentioned, as I mentioned before, 400 millimeters. And the evapotranspiration is more or less 800 millimeters here and 850 millimeters in Madrid. As a result of that, we have the aridity index, index going from the subhumid regions to a semi arid region that we are visiting tomorrow. The problem with the management in these mm, difficult conditions is that we can uh, go to the desertification processes if we don't do things properly. When you read the famous definition of desertification, that is land degradation in arid, semi-arid and dry to humid areas resulting from various factors including climate variation and human activities, in my opinion, this is what matters, the human activities. The climate is the climate, even if there are people that think that we can change the climate, then I'm not so sure. Human activity can be the same as land use. And we have in this data from Eurostat how the land is used in different countries. How they use the land for woodlands, for croplands, grasslands, artificial lands, water, etc. And if we see that Portugal and Spain, and we could be in a bigger place, 
we can notice that they are countries that really, they are very similar. We know that already. The only difference might be that in Portugal there are more woodlands and in Spain there are more croplands. This is because there is another mm -hmm. yes. artificial land. Industry. Artificial land maybe uh, buildings, the oh, roads, urban. yeah, urbanization. Mm -hmm. Not, not. No, it could be used for other things. Another important difference between the west of the Iberian Peninsula and the east is the soil pH. <coughs> you know that if you have a, a slow, a, a low pH, the ability of soil to retain nutrients is not so high. So these soils are a little bit more poorer than this one. And this condition the farmers to use the soil in, a, in one way or another. I'm sure that in your trip, if you were not sleeping, <laughs> you have been able to see this transition of landscape. Yeah. Yeah. You have seen probably this oak square to Suber in, in Portugal and also in Extremadura. Mm -hmm. All these areas uh, acid soils and shallow soils. You, in this area, probably, you have seen this kind of crops. The crops are increasing. And now, in the area that we are going to visit, and around here, and more in the south of Spain, you are going to see this kind of landscape. The most um, uh, direct conclusion of that is, we don't have vegetation here. Land users don't like vegetation in the lands because they think that this is a competition for the crop. This is the result, of course, of decreasing annual rainfall and increasing temperature. What are the crops in Spain? Maize, barley, wheat, vines and olives. And this is the water demand of these different crops. If we see that we have 400 millimeters of rainfall, why are we cropping maize or barley? Well, we can do this because we can use irrigation. Yes, it's okay. We use irrigation, but we are in the limit of resources for having water. Water is a very limited resource. We cannot continue trying to obtain <coughs> water because we are detracting water from every any other thing. And because this is not really suitable for this land, the production that we have of these crops are more or less this. We have five tons per hectare per year of maize, more or less 2.5 tons per hectare of barley, three tons per hectare of wheat, two tons per hectare of, of vine, but it's very, very, very uh, variable because the varieties of grapes are very different. There are some one big like this and other small like that. And the olives, we can have three tons per hectare in olives. But this is the potential production. This potential production is, is true. There are other places in the world where we can have this production. So the farmers try to be uh, closest to this high production. But it is not possible in this land. What do they do? How do farmers try to deal with this water shortage? <laughs> then the response is tillage. Very, uh, a very dry year, more tillage. A very uh, wet year, more tillage. This is the solution for everything. 
One, one uh, reason for that is this traditional. It has been used for millennia. They want to um, destroy the weeds and the pests. They also want to incorporate nutrients. They also want to change the structure of the soil to be more suitable for the seedbed. In general, we can see that plowing in the conventional system for tillage, if we are talking about tree crops, they want to remove weeds and increase infiltration. And regarding annual crops, wheat, etc., they want to prepare the seedbed. <coughs> And this is the enormous amount of machines used for the preparation of the seedbed. We have from the plowing, using the mower plow, you know that this uh, shear is able to move the soil up to 50 centimeters and turn it down to the surface of the soil. After this small work flow, they use maybe a disc flow to cut the will be this cloth of soil because they need a, a smooth structure of soil. After that, they use the chisel flow, this is the cultivator, to uh, prepare the seed bed. And then they use the sowing machine to introduce the seeds and maybe some fertilizer. Some of them, again, use the roller to um, have a good contact between the seed and the soil to improve the germination of seeds. As a result of all these activities on the soil, you have in this land the pattern of tractor wheels track over an area of whatever, 9 meters by 9 meters. You can think that this soil is continu continuously being compacted by the wheels of the tractors. How much soil is here without this track? Very few. This is the aspect that a profile of soil can be after tillage operation. You have a very mm, smooth and uh, uh, small particle size for the seed, <coughs> then a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, and maybe you can have a plow pan, which is an area with a high compaction because the bone density is very high. So, the drawbacks of this traditional tillage, aiming to eliminate all the vegetation, is soil compaction when you use heavy machinery. You have low organic matter in this soil because the tillage is promoting the destruction of soil structure, the aeration and the mineralization of soil organic matter. So you are losing nutrients and you are losing the ability to create structure. And again, the soil structure can change. You can have crusts, you know, the crusts, physical crusts in the upper area of the soil, clods, the big clods, that tomorrow in, in the field trip you are going to see this uh, forever, uh, uh, wherever in, in the place. And you can also have pans. All the combination of all these effects is going to produce a decrease in the yield. How? If you have high compaction, of course you have less porosity. If you have less porosity, you have less ability to retain water in the pore size. So, plants will have water stress, then you are going to decrease yield. If you have low soil organic matter, you also have less porosity because you know that soil organic matter has a bulk density maybe of 0.5 grams per cubic centimeter. Again, 
In addition, you have less nutrients, the structure of the soil is not good, and you have less water retention capacity, vulnerability of these soils, soil erosion, you decrease the depth of the soil, you go to areas of the soil high, having higher bulk density, and then you decrease yield again. And if you have your structure also damaged, you have crusty, <coughs> less infiltration, runoff, erosion, and decrease. <coughs> so, in spite of the intention of farmers to improve the conditions of their soils, due to this so intensive village, they are degrading their soils. And what is the challenge? The challenge is to enhance, to improve, to have more crops, but at the same time increasing the quality of the soil itself. To avoid runoff and to increase the water holding capacity. Of course, only this is not possible. It is not enough to produce more crops because you have to have other factors into account, for example, fertility, the crop varieties and best control, but this is very important. Let me show you this. This is different um, volumes of water in a soil, managed with deep tillage and managed with mulch and minimum tillage. In this case, you have 8% of runoff, water that is losing, and in this case you have one. The evaporation loss here in the deep tillage is 65% and the evaporation is 45% here. And the water available for plants and for crops is 27% with deep tillage and 55% when you have mulch and minimum tillage. Yes. This uh, data, how long was this? Uh, when did you stop the deep tillage and how long did the mulching go on? Because this effect will not be seen after one year or two years. Yeah. So this is the problem. 15, 15 years maybe in Germany. This is the, yes, yes, this is the problem. The, the, the question is that we have to change the mentality of people. When we talk to the farmers, they say directly with this the problem that yeah. uh, maybe a decrease in, in the yields first and then there will be an increase. So this is a nice it's, it's, thing to show for the students, but maybe we should have the real world. world. Like, yeah. In the real world, like changing the system and you have this increase of doubling the water by the prevailing water. But it's true, if, if you know that, if you know that this is true, maybe it takes time. You can help. This is why we have institutions to help the farmers to change this model. Because otherwise, we are degrading the land and this land are going to be abandoned. Because uh, suddenly, one day, you, you try to make your economies and you see that it's not worthy. <laughs> so, I think that we have to think in the long term. And this is why we should try to contact the farmers and inform them about these possibilities, informing them that the first years you are going to be, you are going to have uh, not very nice results, but wait, wait. Alternatives to conventional tillage are possible. Reduced tillage or no tillage. Tomorrow we will see the advantages of this other system of reduced tillage or no tillage in our way. Which are the farmers that have to or should reduce the tillage? Those farms having rainfall when normal cultivation results in high evaporative and runoff losses. So our climatic conditions are going in this point. Farmers that should reduce tillage are those with poorly structured soils that uh, when the soil is very dry you can have dust. In Spain, in this area, we don't have a lot of um, wind erosion, but sometimes we can see 
some colors of, of the soil escaping from the land. These are the clothes that, that I, would, I was mentioned before. This is a, a perfect symbol of a soil that is degraded. Uh, the farmers having plowed pans like this, they should also reduce the intensity of tillage. The farmers living in areas with heavy storms, they also should try to reduce the tillage because once the soil <coughs> is uh, treated with this mechanical aggression is, is very vulnerable to soil erosion. The erodibility increases. And finally, these farmers having their lands in steeply sloping land. These are the conditions of the area that we are going to visit. We have a sloping topography, the traditional Tillage, the traditional way to manage soil is tillage. We have sometimes extreme events with the corresponding erosion, and we also have drought from time to time. Every four years, more or less, we have extreme drought, and this is very, it damages the crops and the rest of um, vegetation if the soil has not the ability to retain water. Regarding the, these heavy storms, you see that uh, when you have a look at the landscape around you, you can see three different types of soil uses or management. The crops, the herbaceous, wheat or barley, etc. The fallow lands, these lands that are being uh, in arrest to recover soil nutrients and the woody crops. These are the months of the year and this is the plant cover. Along the year, these crops are sitting here, then the cover of the soil increases up to this. <coughs> in the case of uh, the fallow land, it also increases with high variation, but not so much. And in the woody crops, the soil cover is always very scarce, more or less 10%. But what happens if you have a storm here? This storm is going to a soil having 70 to 90 percent of cover here, 10 to 50 percent of cover here, and 10 to 20 percent of cover here. The result is evident. You are going to lose the soil in this kind of crops without vegetation covering the soil. The question of slopes is very important in, uh, in Spain and also in Portugal. You can see that. In average, in Spain, we have 16% of slope. According to the ministry recommendations, they say that the arable land could be uh, up to 10% slope. If you do this tillage in, uh, with more slopes, you are going to have problems. It is not recommended a lot for, uh, it is not at all for this 20% uh, of slope. In the land, and if you have lands with more than 50%, just let do this. Uh, you are going to have a forest, and that's it. If we see the colors here of the slopes, we can see that only uh, certain regions have slope between zero and three percent. Hmm? Two plateaus, this and this, and the basins of this and this rivers, which are La Mancha Plateau, Castilla La Mancha, Castilla y León Plateau, the Guadalquivir Basin here in, in yellow, 
and the Ebro Basin. Remember the places where this is, these are the suitable areas for intensive tillage. And this is the map of the European uh, Commission about soils. And this is the organic carbon. You can see that in these areas. Exactly, in the basin of the Ebro, in the basin of the Guadalquivir, in the Castilla-La Mancha Plateau, and not so much in the Castilla-Leon Plateau, we are having very low amount of organic carbon. This is the result of millennia of not so very good management. <coughs> Woody crops such as vineyards and olive groves are particularly vulnerable to soil degradation because they are, they are located in marginal lands. When I say marginal, thin soils or in nutrients and usually sloping because the farmers use the best plants for other crops, for maize, for wheat, etc. These soils are bare, without cover, between the lines, you see here, between the lines of the vines or between the lines of the trees. The soil tries to be bare completely. And this is for a long time because you know how much time can you be using a vineyard, for example? People coming from outside say because they maybe know better these figures. How many years? Or Italy? Are you Italian? Yes, I'm very good at working. Yes. <laughs> so, you are like us, you know. <laughs> yeah. We have many experiments in all groups, more than 10 years' experience. And we have seen the same uh, results. Yes, it's general. For, the, for Mediterranean uh, climates, this is uh, absolutely. Reproducible, yes, where it exists. We can have a vineyard, a productive vineyard for 50 years. You can have more time, but this is just for sentimental reasons because uh, the production increases. And you can have olive groves for more than 100 years. <coughs> they are not, it's not strange having olive groves of. Uh, 150 or even 200 years. Of course, there are olive groves of millennia, 1,000 years, but the production is very small. So, the, the, the consequences of having this bare soil for decades is very important. That's what I said. You have a long term crops from 30 to 200 years. So the soils are experiencing, experiencing runoff and soil loss constantly. Probably this is due to the management. This is the management in Spain of uh, vineyards and olive groves. The most aggressive tillage is this one, the traditional tillage. Yes, 26% of land is used with this very aggressive traditional tillage in the case of <coughs> vineyards and only 12% in the case of olive groves. The other, the minimum tillage, is that as you use the cultivator that goes inside the soil about 15 centimeters, so it is not so uh, disturbing. It is the most common, 62% in vineyards and 42% in olive groves. The good news is that we have a 25% of spontaneous cover crops in vineyards. I don't know if you have been in Andalusia, in Andalusia. <laughs> uh, they have um, the topography is uh, not easy, and the 
the air smells as uh, olives. They have, at least after a lot of years, they have understood that they have to protect the soil with crops. And the easiest way to do it is spontaneous vegetation. Huh. You see that there are small groups of different management that no maintenance is abandoned, no tillage, very few. Tomorrow, or tomorrow we will talk about why no tillage is not very used in, in, in the center of the peninsula, I hope. <laughs> and inert covers, seed covers, for example, you can see the barley in the strips or your vineyard. And then you can cut it. Many options, we will, we will see. Uh, if you have in mind these figures that we are living with vulnerable soils, we are having only 400 millimeters of rainfall a year. You have to know that to create one kilogram of biomass, we need between 306 liters of water. And considering that the, the tolerable soil loss is uh, around one ton per hectare, according to the last uh, reviews and publications, I'm going to show you some real examples of this is uh, with a simulated rainfall in the area that we are going to visit tomorrow. And when you compare a rainfall simulation in a bare soil with the same soil from here to here, this is a covered soil, this is the runoff in time. In the peak of this line, you have 35% of runoff. This is amazing. I think that considering 400 millimeters, we are losing 35% of 400 millimeters. So the real water that this soil is receiving is only 260 millimeters. <coughs> we are going to the line Transpassing this red line of aridity index. The covered soil has almost no, run, no runoff, so we are conserving the water in soil. Another example this is in a vineyard, for example, with three different cover crops. The minimum tillage is not traditional tillage, the minimum tillage and two different covers of barley and brachypodium, both cereals. You see that this, along to these two years, the accumulated soil loss is for the minimum tillage around 10, this is uh, <coughs> grams per square meter, that is equivalent to 10 tons per hectare of soil loss. The influence of cover crops in soil organic matter and water retention. This is another experiment in a vineyard, and you have the tillage, uh, two covers, seed covers, Brachypodium and Secale, Cereale, and we see that two things. The bulk density is slightly decreasing, although we don't have significant differences. But the tendency is the reduction of bulk density, then increase of porosity. And more importantly, the soil organic matter is increasing from 0.6 to 0.9 in these four years. Maybe this has, this has a reflection in the water retention curve. You know that? If you, don't, if you are not familiar with this, uh, course you are going to be because uh, this is the topic of the next talk after the coffee break. This is the volumetric soil moisture and this is the matric potential in PM. I will explain. You are 
moving the ability of soil to retain water, considering the shape of this course. And means that, for example, the Secale Cereale has more, no, 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 Brachypodium distracti is this one, has more total porosity than uh, tillage or Secale. And in the same, in, and in the other side of the graph, we are also looking for this separation. What this means is that changes in soil organic matter and changes in bulk density are going to have an effect on the ability of soil to retain water. We will see more detail in a few minutes. So, we want to restore the soil. How can we restore the soil? Increasing vegetation cover. How can we do this? Direct seeding. So we don't want to tillage. No plowing, please. Maybe sometimes we have to, to plow a little bit. No tillage. Vegetative buffer zones between crops are very important to stop erosion and introducing cover companion crops in woody crops such as olive groves, vineyards and fruit orchards. These are all the possibilities that we can use to avoid degradation. This sustainable land management can be agronomic from the vegetation and structural. The agronomic have been mentioned all the time. Reduced tillage, no tillage, conservative tillage. Mulching, you know, the mulching is not <coughs> the rest of the, uh, of the crops inside. And manuring is adding organic matter to the soil. You can use grasses in the street, in the streets, in the intercrops, leaf fences, etc. And from the structural measures, you can create terraces, walls, barriers, banks, banks, etc. We are reshaping the landscape. It's a very hard work. But this is the thing that our mm, ancestors did in the past. Now we think that it's too expensive and it's not worthy. But maybe we are wrong. Why we cannot have this kind of agricultural landscape instead of this? This is the landscape that you are going to visit tomorrow. It's a way. You will see this tomorrow. The steps. This is my final. <laughs> Slide. Uh, if we increase the carbon in the near surface of the soil, in the top soil, you will be able to create aggregation and promote infiltration. If we do this, we will increase the water and nutrient holding capacity. In doing this, you will have better quality for air and water because you don't have erosion, you don't have wind erosion or water erosion. And doing this, you could improve the productivity. As Sylvie said before, later, it, it cannot be done in, in 10 years maybe. Oh, maybe in 10 years, yes. Mm -hmm. But not in two or three years. And the farmers cannot wait because they live of their land, so they need help. Maybe these, the subsidies are made for these kind of things. Mm -hmm. I think there is, oh, yes. If we are using this sustainable land management, we will be able to change this kind of maps again. And this Iberian Peninsula is an area of Europe, maybe with Greece, and I don't know, a little parts of Italy, mm -hmm. The Cinderella's of the organic carbon, the soil. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So I'm finished. If you have any question, question. I have wrote in many th official documents that the uh, tolerable program for uh, soil loss was 12 tons per hectare. Yeah. And I was surprised when I was see because one ton per hectare is nothing for the Mediterranean island. So I don't know. 10 yeah. to 12 tons per hectare are the recommendation of the FAO yeah. and the USDA. And the they are working in uh, completely different soils. Deep soils, other climate, uh, other climatic conditions. For them, if you have a soil with one meter depth, you can lose 10 tons per hectare. But we can't <coughs> do this because in very few period of in a very short period of time, you have no soil. No, no, I know, it is annoying. I was surprised because I have wrote many official documents and, and one was surprised for me to establish the UNRWA because it's not official, it's a, Just yeah, paper. It's a paper, okay, mm -hmm. it's only to know. But it is more and more cited everywhere mm -hmm. because I think it's more reasonable to have mm -hmm. this kind of soil in certain environments. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have uh, uh, many experiments in southern Italy. You now we close uh, and run yet more than 10 years now. And uh, we have seen exactly the same results. And I would like to ask you, uh, have you measured the soil organic matter deeper than 10 centimeters? Deeper than 10 centimeters? No, not me. Have you found something? Yes, we have measured uh, until 40 centimeters. And we have seen differences. Yeah. More organic matter or less? More. Most. Yeah. In color growth uh, systems. This is going to be important because you know that now the balances of organic carbon in the world, they want to measure the organic carbon in the first meter yes. of the soil. But some, you know, you all know that we don't have money enough to do all the things that we would like to do. I New Zealand. Zealand. New Zealand, uh, there was a PhD student last year that was measuring until one meter and he had seen differences but he hasn't published yet his results. And we, we also accept the gold crop uh, application in southern Italy. We apply also the, um, the prunings. So we leave the prunings in the field and this helps a lot uh, for the nutrients. To increase the nutrients and with the cover crops, the soil has higher porosity and can keep uh, higher amounts of uh, water. Uh, the last thing we're going to have a farmer who's a really he's a scientific farmer, if I can <laughs> say. Yes, he, he, he's doing all these practices. He thinks about uh, in his pillow how can I improve the organic matter, and he's doing amazing things in his vineyards and it, it is very interesting yes. because he's not a scientist but he thinks like a scientist so uh, i'm going to sit uh, in front of him <laughs> for this kind of discussions